introducing the first speaker. I think he should be the first speaker, uh, Garrett uh, Banwell, uh, to present to us a following brief in uh, uh, capitalism and uh, other reflections of environmental health related psychological distress. I hope that is, sorry, is that the first presenter, sorry? Uh, that's the second. <laughs> Sorry. That's uh, fine. Garrett can present first. Okay, fine. Yeah, th thanks. Uh, Garrett Brummer is a clinical psychologist in South African Medical Research Council, a scholar and PhD candidate at the Nelson Mandela University um, in, the Cape, in, in Eastern Cape Town. Uh, his current research focuses on uh, community psychological responses to land and environmental injustice. Um, in West Limpopo and the Western Cape provinces. Um, so I think uh, uh, from his presentation, we will uh, be able to see his uh, approach to um, experiences of distress uh, related to structural violence. Yeah, so we want to welcome you, Garrett, for your presentation. And uh, Thanks very much, Prof. to listening to you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm just going to try share here. Um, Give me two seconds. Can everyone see that? Uh, can everyone hear me? Correct? Okay, cool. So um, what I'm going to do today, my name is Garrett. I'm a clinical psychologist. i um, been practicing as a psychologist for a good couple of years now. And um, I run a private practice in Johannesburg, and uh, then I'm also a PhD candidate at Nelson Mandela University in the Eastern Cape, and a Bongani Mayosi scholar through the Medical Research Council of South Africa. And what I want to present today is just some of the research that I started conducting in 2019. Um, that looks at the psychological impacts of environmental degradation, basically. And so what I present to you today is kind of a culmination of two papers, but really um, all in the same area. Uh, what I decided to do was to take out the Vemba district uh, case study and just focus on the Northwest. And um, some of the background was is that I work for the Department of Health in the past and then about in 2006, I moved to Rustenburg uh, to work in Rustenburg on mainly sexual violence uh, in the Platinum Belt, um, which is in the Northwest and uh, where this case study is that I'm going to present on. And uh, for me, just personally, it was a very transformational moment because I started seeing mental health uh, very differently, like Prof uh, Mulemi said, he mentioned the word structural violence. And uh, through that lens, I started to kind of attribute psychological distress very differently. So um, the first paper uh, was published, uh, or the main paper of the case study was published this month in the Community Psychology and Global Perspective Journal. Uh, and then the second paper, which was actually published earlier this year, uh, was in the British Psychology Society, uh, the first special issue on uh, climate change. And this was quite a monumental study because you start seeing this kind of drive for associations, medical associations and healthcare associations to move towards, you know, really thinking about uh, climate change. And um, in, the, in the second paper, the BPS one, what I do, and I'm, I'm, I'll be happy to circulate it to anyone, but um, what you see kind of happening internationally is that uh, how the stress is framed, um, I think most people recognize kind of the this, this structural elements of distress. Uh, so environmental injustices, um, uh, previous issues of, of, of land conversions and all of that. But a couple of the health associations, and one in particular, the American Psychology Association, 
I first started to kind of come out with this medical, uh, quite a medicalized perspective on um, this distress that we experience in relationship to the rest of the world. So this is just a, this map is just a search term and they, uh, um, and they speak about it in that report, I think it comes from 2016 or 2017, about climate anxiety. And um, this is just from the Google Trends, which is a very nice uh, tool to see how, uh, how much a certain term has been searched. And we see the term mainly being searched in uh, the global north. Uh, so it made me question very much, you know, what's, what is the contextual validity of this term? And what does environmental health related distress look like in um, context other than the global north? So I draw from the term um, in, in the title of the capitalist scene, and it's really, it's a term used by Jason Moore um, to speak about how um, the area that we live in, and he's, he's got a book where he says, you know, uh, we call this area that we live in in the Anthropocene or the capitalist team. Um, and how he says we, we should really be thinking about uh, how the world, how the world's ecologies are kind of being restructured by the systems that, that we're in. And I thought that this was an interesting term in this picture really representing um, that. So on the left hand side there, um, you see indigenous Afro-Montane from Femba district in the north. Um, and on the right hand side, you see the land that's been converted for pine plantations that I thought kind of symbolized the lungs in a sense that we're living with at the moment. Um, so the case study that I'll be painting on is in uh, Rustenburg. This is the sense of platinum mining. Um, not only in South Africa, but in the world. Um, it holds, I think, 70% of the world's platinum resources. And uh, we're going to be focusing on Rustenburg, but just in general, uh, you see the mining industry stretching across that entire bush igneous complex. So there where you see the more gray area, um, that's basically mostly uh, due to mines. Uh, next door as well, which I won't go into, but something quite notable is <coughs> Marikon is part of the Rustenburg municipality, where we also had um, the Marikon massacres a couple of years back. Um, so these are uh, very contend contended spaces. Um, this is one of, uh, if I'm correct, Sibanya at the time when I took the photo, that's the shaft of Svanya. In the community, there's uh, Sondela. And you see communities, some communities at least, living um, alongside the mine. So on the one side, the extraction of this incredible uh, wealth coming from the earth, but also as you'll see from participant statements later, um, the kind of distress that um, this causes. So just one of the, when we're thinking about today's about breath and how um, I said how psychological um, distress is interlinked with our environment through breath, uh, I can't see it perfectly at the moment because the uh, presenters are covering it. But the quote basically says, you know, the outside world um, if it's a healthy ecology, we, we integrate it within ourselves. Um, if it's an unhealthy ecology, we also integrate um, that environment within ourselves as well. Um, and we see how this has an impact on health. So for instance, with this recent study with uh, COVID-19 and how more deaths are attributable to places with poorer air quality. So, it's a very, it's a small case study um, that, that I conducted in 
in Northwest. Uh, I did one focus group and 10 participant interviews. Um, and the idea was that it would be really uh, ex uh, exploratory um, to kind of get a broad idea of what people were speaking about in relationship to distress. So I try not to overgeneralize the findings, but to highlight some areas that I thought were um, places of concern that we should really focus on. Um, so the main environmental threats that, and this comes from a, a BBS paper, the main environmental threats that people re reported was water scarcity, environmental pollution, biodiversity loss and climate change, and how this also interacts with histories of um, uh, uh, land conversions, particularly for the extractive industry. So in the second paper, what I do is I try to uh, put this in a bit of a conceptual model to understand how distress has formed over time. And I noticed uh, uh, trying, to, trying to make sense of the findings, I noticed this process that was going on related to uh, psychological distress. So there's uh, Rob Nixon, who's an environmental humanities scholar, um, speaks of slow violence, how uh, violence isn't always direct or catastrophic. What we see is it creeping across time and it has implications on, on our social and ecological world. So a lot of the distress that people spoke about actually had, had to do with certain land injustices, people being um, pushed off of their land during um, related to histories of colonization and also apartheid era um, policies. And what, what this seemed to have, have done was, and quite, quite I think obviously, is uh, uh, broken or hindered the dialogue that people have uh, in relationship to land. Um, so specifically ancestral land, uh, and that's essentially had an impact on uh, how ex how people experience their relationship to place at the moment. What we see over time since the introduction of the extractive industries, you have also these cumulative forms, like what um, participants spoke about about the environmental threats, so water scarcity. Um, biodiversity loss and so forth. And um, this has an impact then uh, on people in terms of creating a certain environmental health distress, which I'll speak more about later. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize, which I'll go in a bit later, is that uh, there's a lot of uh, community organizing that takes place. And uh, this is what I focus on mainly in the second paper, but what I won't focus on much now. Um, but a lot of action in trying to achieve uh, participatory or procedural justice to try and also slow down the impacts or mitigate the impacts of slow violence on communities into uh, things like uh, land restitution um, being important for restoring the sense of dialogue with place. Um, I only briefly touch on that, but I'm happy to share the paper with anyone. In terms of health and breath, uh, what we see is um, how psychological distress presents is that there's a sense of intrusiveness of the environment. Um, so people being concerned about air quality, particulate matter, contamination of water and so forth. And um, there being a sense of exposure, except um, what I like to compare it to is almost uh, COVID, for instance. You can't, you don't know where the boundaries of the virus are. You can't see the virus. You can't, um, you don't know how the virus is gonna have an impact on you. And that's similar to how people experience um, perceived contamination or worries about uh, air pollution. It causes uh, quite a bit of distress. 
Um, so people also saying um, the intrusiveness is quite practical. So if, uh, if you're living so close to um, the mine shafts, for instance, you'll have dust that you have to sweep off your porch every day. You'll have, um, when, when I was walking in Sambela, for instance, uh, when, when I was working in 2016, people also wanted to show me how, how um, the community had built their own barricades against the, um, the dirt coming from the shafts. And um, yeah, just generally uh, the sense of intrusiveness and the health uncertainty of potential contamination causes uh, distress. That's just a view from the top. So maps being very uh, useful when you study these kind of things. Uh, because you can see the proximity. Uh, another, this is uh, from someone's house. So that sense of intrusiveness or vulnerability, uh, this was perceived as being from blasting um, in and around the community. And uh, a couple of houses will have cracks going through them. Um, then also um, bearing in mind that that there is a contestation for power in the area. So um, this was some of the residents constructed, um, put infrastructure on their property and the traditional authority uh, broke down houses um, overnight. And I think that there was a legal case that followed this as well. And um, this is interesting in the sense of the changing Kind of dynamics in the place. This is a, a hotla, so a, a, a traditional meeting place um, where uh, some of the people that I interviewed were, and, and some were traditional leaders, were very distressed over because people came and cut down the trees in the middle of the night where the meeting used to be held. So this kind of tension between uh, extractive environments um, uh, and the relationship with ancestral land. So powers, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but I imagine not much. Um, but power is very much contested in the area. So after the Americana massacre, you had um, a community organization being established that would, uh, for uh, recognition uh, justice, basically, so that there's a voice or representation uh, to, to the mines for mine affected communities, not only uh, mine workers. Um, there's a very strong move towards trying to improve participation and procedural justice in the area. So for instance, the groups involved with um, different forms of critical education, kind of helping community and as community led helping communities kind of know what the policies are, know how it impacts them, translating um, different voices and bringing them into traditional structures. Um, and then also monitoring how certain things like the social labor plans or the environmental impact assessments are being implemented um, in communities. And then also what, what I find really, really interesting is just uh, community health monitoring. So community, uh, reports being conducted, uh, very ground up reports uh, where um, the, the group would interview different community members, but also do spot visits at healthcare facilities and stuff like that. So it's trying to, in a way, trying to create an alternative uh, narrative and bring, bring uh, what has been submerged in the extractive zone to the fore. Um, yeah, so I think just to, I'm going to finish up here, but just to kind of reflect on what I've said, uh, the process, it really changes the way that we see psychological distress in these settings. And psychology for very long has taken a very um, ameliorative kind of response. So looking at treating the symptom rather than the cause. But when we uh, follow breath and we follow environmental health uh, issues, 
we see that we actually led to um, justice struggles, essentially. And uh, so the argument that I make or have been making in my research so far and what I want to continue to develop is that um, psychologists actually have an important role to play, not, uh, not only in witnessing distress, but probably attributing distress um, to these structural uh, issues that, that are still perpetuated today. Um, so also just to say that the mining industry in, in terms of the history of South Africa is probably the least transformed industry. Um, so if you look at in terms of race, but also if you look at gender, so the quota for gender is only something like 10% uh, for women, which is incredibly low. So there's a completely a complete imbalance in um, many of these extractive zones. So I'm going to finish there. Anyone who'd like to email me or to uh, have access to the reports, they're, they're freely available online, but I'll be happy to email them to you as well. Thanks very much. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Greg, for your uh, insightful presentation about uh, environmental distress. Um, I think even um, given the order of presentation, uh, we will keep our questions to the end. And uh, I'm sorry for having like uh, altered the order. Um, we'll keep our questions to the end so that we can uh, present the questions uh, to all the presenters. Um, at this juncture, I want to introduce uh, uh, Chan Lavre uh, to make the presentation. Um, Chen Lavre is a lecturer in the Department of English uh, at the University of Pretoria um, and um, researcher on Oceanic Humanities uh, for the Global South project based in the uh, Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research at Weiser in the University of Witwatersrand. She explores uh, literary and cultural representations of uh, Deep Ocean and Indian Ocean and the Southern Ocean in Antarctica Sea, um, researching oceanic underworld. Uh, I think from this uh, background, uh, it would be interesting to see, um, uh, to hear about um, the perception of breathing underwater, or underwater environment. Uh, we hope to hear much from uh, Chan about uh, underwater breathing. Uh, welcome. Um, for your presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to this. And um, I hope that you can make sense of the kind of interdisciplinary experiment that is happening. Um, let me, uh, I have to apologize in advance for the drilling that is going on in my home and which might disturb the presentation now and again. So if it's very annoying, I apologize. Um, and I also just wanted to thank Carla, Charlotte, and this particularly Norwazi um, for organizing this, for taking us online in such an amazingly you know, immense and uh, ambitious way. Um, and Norwazi really for getting me into this in the first place. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Um, we will begin. Okay, so it's a paper in three parts. It's very kind of um, um, sort of trying to do a lot of things at once, partly because of the interdisciplinary nature of this forum. So I'm, I'm, I'm a literary and cultural scholar um, by training and um, that can be quite sort of precise and niche to an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary audience. So I've been trying to think through what um, theoretical methodological in, uh, interventions I can make into a wider conversation, um, but we will have a little bit of um, poetry at the end. Um, and it's, it's a paper in three parts, and I'm I'm going to reprise what I put online, um, as it was in a PowerPoint format, and it'll be in a video format after the session if you'd like to um, take a look at it. Um, but I'm I'm not sure. 
all have seen it, so I'm just going to um, repeat a lot of what was in there. Um, so I'm going to start with an anecdote about learning to dive, which is really what made me think of the connection um, to the overall breath symposium. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how that has fit into or shifted my own research. Um, and then I'll move to um, a very brief discussion of kind of where I'm taking this in terms of my literary criticism. So I'd been um, doing oceanic studies for about, um, I don't know, 10 years, PhD, uh, master's and PhD, and then some postdoctoral research. And it was very much about um, linking the surface networks of globalization um, across the kind of global south, across southern shores, particularly focused on the Indian Ocean. And I've been slowly moving towards uh, considering the ocean itself, particularly motivated by rising seas in a time of climate change. Um, but I'd never been there. And it was something I was quite aware of when I went to conferences and was fielding questions about the submarine, which I was increasingly talking about in its literary and cultural forms. But I had um, not done this thing that is um, not widely accessible. It's an expensive and so very elite occupation to go, um, well, not occupation, um, recreational activity to go diving but it is also something that's been available to the humanity as a species for like 100 years so um in 2018 i had the opportunity to go to um to do a month's research stay at the university of dar es salaam um and it's part of the wonderful african humanities program if anyone is um phd or postdoc you should apply um and i sort of saved up my meager stipend and learned to dive the dive course was um on the tiny uh, waterfront uh, in Dar es Salaam, um, in a sort of really quite damp basement underneath a uh, one of the sort of fancier hotels, and we used the hotel pool, snuck up the back stairs, and used the whole hotel pool to do the initial lessons, and then did my first dives in Dar Harbor, which has been completely demolished um, the, the seafloor by um, dynamite fishing. Nevertheless, despite all of those things, and uh, it was a really revelatory experience, which will be very familiar for anyone who's listening who has done diving, uh, but it wasn't familiar to me. So I'm sort of approaching this kind of beginner mind. Um, it was just that there was like this whole world beneath that thin reflective film of the sea surface. And so that was one thing. Um, and it was also that the experience of being a body underwater. I had thought of my lungs as filled with air, but I hadn't felt so viscerally the other cavities in my body, which are also air pockets, the holes in the bones of my face, for instance. Um, you know, I, I know that I had sinuses, but not exactly where they were. Um, my ear tubes and then things like the air between goggles and eyes becomes important. So the air in each of these little cavities compresses underwater and can be incredibly painful unless you learn to equalize. So um, there's there certainly more of a of a, of a hindrance, these little tiny body cavities, but the lungs themselves are a powerful balloon actually that you can manipulate in order to shift not just um you know, kind of you know regulate your safety underwater but also where you are in space in three-dimensional watery space breathing underwater does things rather than simply reflects changes in your emotions and physiology it's as much a tool as a function it gets faster when you're excited so if you see an interesting coral or fish and so your lungs fill with air you become more buoyant you float away from the thing that you were trying to look at um, breathing out brings you back down. Experienced divers can follow the rises and hollows of the seafloor using only the balloon of their lungs, breathing in and out to go up and down. So the internal topography of the body, its gaps and hollows, which are acutely felt when diving, um, and that gives a kind of proprioceptive insight into the air's movement through the body. What I was interested in, it, in is the way in which this maps experientially onto the external topography of the sea floor. There's also this um, kind of new awareness of environmental physics. Um, so pressure underwater is measured in atmospheres. So 10 meters down, as you can see on the graph, the pressure is two atmospheres, at 20 it's three and so on. And atmosphere is the weight of all the air above you. So if you're standing on the beach, there's this column of air above your head 
kilometers high, whose total weight is equal to just 10 meters of water. And that weight of the air we move through every day is much harder to ignore when you felt its equivalent weight in water. So what I was thinking is, you know, the kind of different scales of this analogy. Um, so the shape of the body is linked to the shape of the sea, but also to this kind of place on the planet. This um, has informed this kind of embodied uh, anecdotal experience has informed my research in, um, in ways that actually are in keeping with a, a new wave to use an, a pun of, of oceanic studies in the humanities. Um, that was a one I can't, don't have time for. Um, Melody Jew in her book, Wild uh, Blue Media, actually published this year, Thinking Through Seawater. She describes the effects of diving on her research practice in media studies, um, and particularly its perceptual shift. So in terms of how a perception is, ch is changed in different environments. And she says, the practice of learning to dive has directed my attention to how our instinctive postures, embodied habits, and muscle memory are all adapted to the gravitational conditions of walking on land and breathing air amid a range of abilities. Indeed, these terrestrial habits of movement and orientation are so ingrained as to be virtually invisible, unless one experiences the interruption through a change in body state, a gross spurt, dizziness, injury, or a change in milieu, parachuting, swimming, diving. The experience of diving generates what she calls milieu-specific analysis, which draws attention to the differences between different perceptual environments, such as environment of air, which we just think of as you know, normal, normal life, or the environment of water, and how we think in and through them as embodied observers. She actually has a chapter, which I discovered after proposing uh, the talk for this um, panel called Breathing Underwater, in which she theorizes the interface, um, which is a, a kind of critical term in media studies research, um, as that importantly also as an interface between air and water, or for instance, blood and cells, and these fluid interfaces. So I've taken partly her idea, partly my experience, and shifted it um, to both literary studies and to southern seas, particularly the Indian Ocean, which was the area of my research. So what are some of the ways of thinking through the interface of the sea surface in relation to the literature and imaginaries of the Indian Ocean? So um, the contact zone with which Mary Louise Pratt in um, my um, in literary studies made us familiar is the beach, which is the coastal ecotone, which marks the meeting between land and sea, and also between culture and culture. It's sort of the beach is a model of cultural contact that derives in large part from the Pacific, but which applies also and perhaps even more richly to the densely populated shores of the Indian Ocean, connected over centuries by the monsoon and early south-south globalization. But I became interested in um, another interface, so this meeting of not land and sea, but air and water at the sea surface, um, partly because the vertical mixing of heat layers in the ocean and the circulating of currents, particularly actually in the southern I Indian Ocean, which is absorbing um, a huge percentage of global ocean warming, or global warming generally. Um, and also kind of this notion of the depths, which I, I got from Caribbean poetry in particular, um, as acting as a memorial to the injustices of racialized capitalism. So if Indian Ocean studies, as I've been looking at them, particularly writers like Amitav Ghosh, Abdurrazak Gurna, Lindsay Collin, um, conceive of the Indian Ocean as a uh, sort of culture, a world, a global culture of, of coastal cosmopolitanism, um, evoking the transnational connections across South-South region, it's like an alternative view of um, early globalization. But what I've been calling for in my research, or what I've been trying to think about shifting our perspective, so that generates this kind of map, the ones that we can see here. What I've been calling for is what I'm calling a bathymetric reading, which is, um, bathymetry is, is how you measure the topography of the seafloor. Um, and, and this, you know, is a map which shows um, fewer words and nations and political views, but much more the, the geography of the planet um, if we are looking through the sea surface. So to move very briefly to the literature, um, the, the two very famous poems, very canonical that you might have done in school or university, um, which use diving as a metaphor. 
One is um, Derek Walcott's A Sea is History, and the other one is Adrian, Adrian Rich's um, Diving into the Wreck. Into the Wreck, sorry. Um, and in Derek Walcott's The Sea is History, he, um, it's kind of read as a, the canonical post-colonial poem, um, and it suggests that Caribbean and by analogy, other post-colonial nations, it's sort of answering the accusation that what they don't have is the museums and the um, monuments and the uh, history and culture of the, um, oh, I'm looking at the chat. Um, Charlotte, you're gonna have to explain. <laughs> um, what, what they don't have is the, um, is all of those things. But what they do have in, in the, the speaker of the poem suggests is the sea and the sea is the history. Um, uh, thanks Charlotte, that's perfect. Um, and that's partly, I mean, it's a complicated poem and it's partly um, suggesting that um, what it has is post-colonial history so it doesn't need this kind of hundreds of years of cathedrals. Um, but also suggesting that, you know, that there is a, is a, you know, memorializing the violence of the Middle Passage, which meant that many lives were lost overboard uh, in the transatlantic slavery. Um, but also, and I think in, in rereading the poem more recently, I've noticed the ways in which this allegorical reading, you know, the sense that um, diving into the sea is a way of retrieving post-colonial history um, for, for post-colonial nations that don't have things like monuments, et cetera, is also very much a poem about diving. Um, so, you know, in the poem, the speaker, for anyone who wants to return to it, we can't go into detail here, but, you know, he says, strop on these goggles, which is a great word for stopping on goggles. I'll guide you there myself. And he says, it's all subtle and submarine through submarine through colonnades of coral, past the Gothic windows of sea vans, the crusty group are onyx eyed. And it's all these very vivid um, and ac ecologically quite accurate descriptions of the um, experience of diving a coral reef. The other poem is also considered that that's that's really famous. Um, oh, I just wanted to say, you know, this is has now been the kind of artistic equivalent is Jason Dickes Taylor's um, mem um, memorials to the slave trade, but also to post-colonial history, which are actually located in the on the on the sea floor and are meant to be covered in undersea life because they can also only be seen while diving. So there's this um, notion of like embodied um, uh, viewership. Um, Adrian Rich's um, uh, poem, Diving into the Wreck, is also considered a kind of uh, poem about feminism in which the diving is just an, an allegory for the experience of also a kind of the historylessness of women in relationship to men um, and and diving into this wreck of human history. But that poem too is a very, if taken quite literally, is also um, about the body armor of black rubber, the absurd flippers involved in diving, the grave and awkward mask. So there's a kind of um, literal reading of these poems, which has also been theorized by a number of scholars in literature more generally. But what I wanna pick up on is that a student named Manus um, has recently deployed Christina Sharp's um, In the Wake, uh, which is a reading about transatlantic history um, and, and particularly kind of asking a similar question to, to Derek Walcott, you know, where are the grave sites of the lost, of the drowned? Um, and saying, well, they're actually not necessarily on the seafloor in a coral reef, but they're actually floating as atoms in the in oceanic liquid. Um, and we should so we should consider the whole ocean the grave site in the memorial at a molecular level. Um, and so Neymanus uses this to reread um, Rich's poem in a time of Eric Garner's um, I Can't Breathe. The shipwreck and the submarine world of Rich's poem and her reading are infused with the atoms of those people who were thrown overboard and are out there in the ocean even today. That's from Sharp. And this constitutes what Neymanus calls the breathless sea. And she asks, in what ways is the ocean also an archive of breathlessness? 
does weather making and its socio-atmospherics of power extend beyond our immediate habitat, beyond the air that we breathe to sink into the sea? The Breath of Sea, of course, also describes the sea itself, not just its human histories. Um, and it's absorbing, absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at an unprecedented rate at the moment and becoming deoxygenated. Um, so the sea itself is running out of air. So there's a link here between the lungs of the planet and our lungs, the kind of compressible lungs that I started with. Um, a planetary drowning prefigured by a number of works, and I'll just give you one example, um, which is called uh, The Deep by River Solomons. So it's this, for this reason, the eventual imminent submersion that I'm turning to work that imagines both drowning and breathing underwater, so survivance. Um, and I, I thought uh, if I have one minute left, Charlotte, I would just end with a poem by, um, which brings it much more from this Atlantic Caribbean context towards what I've been looking at, which is Yvette Christiansa, um, a number of other writers, Nikki Finney, um, um, Mahale Moshigo. Um, uh, and I will just finish with this poem by Khabeba Badarun. One second though. <laughs> Sorry. Um, one second. Um, this poem is, um, it starts, Louise and I hurtled down the M5 in my black jory, beating the evening rush to Cork Bay for the end of the year party at Jane and David's place. And this is the stanza. We coil around sunrise circles, stop by Musenberg, peel off our clothes and dive through phosphorescence, our hair a meniscus at sunset at the shore at the end of light. And it goes on, I look back at that night, halfway and perpetual, and we are swimming out further into the southern ocean, untethered to time, where gravity's centrifuge makes us south and east and all the cardinal points. Our five pointed fingers turning to the earth's commands, floating on breath and reflection and the body's physics, night endless in all directions. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Charm. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name well. Um, and thanks, Charlotte for, Charlotte, for helping us keep the time. Uh, I can say a very good interface here. Uh, poetry and the experience of uh, underwater and uh, here yeah, I was thinking about underworld also whether it's the same uh, but see we can um, yeah we can also keep the questions because we have plenty time at the end so that we can put the questions to the speakers jointly uh, in, in that, with, that in the, with that in mind um, then I would like to get very quickly our our last but not least of the speakers, Bianca, uh, Bianca Masuku, uh, to speak to us about um, a war's arts in science to engage young people around infectious disease. Um, uh, I think uh, taking a kind of uh, um, approach maybe from their research um, on collaboration. And uh, I think I would like to uh, to invite uh, Bianca. I did not get your, uh, your resume, but I believe that uh, you will tell us something a bit about yourself and we, uh, we continue. It is very interesting to hear about this from, uh, um, from the perspective of the, the FOSA. I do not know how to do the click sound. I welcome Bianca uh, to make your presentation. Thank you so much, Benson. And thank you to the organizers of um, this event. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Bianca, as has been stated, and I am a PhD candidate at the University of Cape Town. I'm based in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Um, and my project explores, um, my PhD project is exploring TB in Kailicha um, using this community engagement project called EWOZA. Um, and yeah, I can let me just jump into my presentation and hopefully it's um, enlightening and entertaining for everybody. So my presentation today um, 
I'll be showcasing the work of this public engagement project um, called EWOZA. And I'll be talking about the ways in which the program brings together science and art for young people in Kailicha um, to explore the impact of infectious diseases, particularly um, TB, in their communities. Uh, I do so to show how through working with young people in the township about um, issues that surround experiences of infectious diseases, the program has been attempting to find new and meaningful ways to work with communities in Kailicha, sorry, uh, to understand the complexities of ill health within the township. So I'm going to begin my presentation by providing a, a brief summary of uh, what Iwaza is and, and, and its program. So it was a, is a youth-based TB public engagement project um, that was established in 2014 and emerged from the Medical Microbacteriology Research Unit at UCT, the MMRU. And it is a collaboration involving uh, TB biomedical researchers, um, a conceptual artist, anthropologist, oof, sorry, I forgot that I wanted to share my screen. So sorry for that. Um, Give me a moment. Here we go. Okay. So it's a, a collaboration involving biomedical researchers, um, a, a conceptual artist, anthropologists, musicians, and young people living in Kailicha, in, um, a township in Cape Town. The program operates at the intersection of public engagement, youth education, and advocacy with the ultimate aim of addressing stigma um, and encouraging positive health seeking behavior, ultimately aiming to mitigate, mitigate the fear and stigma um, and to contribute to a reduction in the social and public health burden of disease. So it was this core program um, with the projects that have been running the longest uh, have been closely focused on TB. And the first arm of the project is what the, what's uh, called the Iwaza Dockies, uh, which engage uh, youth in Kailisha with current TB biomedical research conducted in the Institute of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine at UCT. This is the IDM. And so after a series of interactive scientific workshops, learners are guided in the production of short uh, documentaries about the personal and social impact um, of TB with the production of four to five documentaries annually. The second arm of the pro project is um, the MSF Nuzo Drug Resistant TB Collabo, which is a collaboration with uh, Doctors Without Borders, which is MSF, which facilitates um, storytelling between uh, survivors of drug resistant TB and young Kailicha based musicians. So the aim is the production of music, music videos, and poetry reflecting the experience of surviving uh, drug resistant TB um, and HIV. And the third arm is the It Was a Schools program, um, which uses media produced in the first two projects uh, described above to stimulate robust discussion with high school learners around TB and the social determinants of health. So within the It Was a Docu's program, hmm. which is my focus today, Learners are recruited from a local tutoring um, NGO called Ikamva Youth within Kailija. They are then introduced to the biomedical arm of the project through these science workshops, where learners would be guided through a series of topics around uh, biomedical TB research and the various lab laboratory practices within the IDM at UCT. Here, the topics range from uh, learning about the basics of TB, such as understanding the bacteria, to exploring the intricacies of TB drug discovery, vaccinology, and the complexities of TB clinical trials. From here, the project moves into uh, media workshops, where learners are introduced to elements of media production and equipped to produce short documentary films about health-related issues that interest them in their own communities. To date, the project has intense, uh, intensively engaged about 85 learners, and each year it conducts six biomedical research workshops. It has about 24 documentaries produced by uh, learners in the program and relies on online 
uh, dissemination through um, YouTube and Facebook uh, with a following of about 40,000 people so far. In addition to this, it conducts two to three screenings of the documentaries produced each year to local residents within the township and uses this as a re recruitment opportunity to engage more learners within the township. So the learner driven media produced over the past few years has been a way for young people to explore TB um, and surrounding issues in their respective communities and engage with the perspectives of people in their neighborhoods. In the beginning of the program, learners used these interactions with local residents to explore TB biomedical knowledge, understandings around the causes of TB, perspectives around transmission and local practices around treatment and prevention. However, as the work of the program has progressed, uh, newer cohorts of learners each year uh, began to shift to a focus on more personal experiences of TB illness with relatives, with neighbors, and with individuals, um, individuals in their social networks. Um, and their films began to reveal intimate and more nuanced narratives about uh, experiences of, of ill health within the township, um, as these pictures show here. So with this, what emerged were stories about the challenges of um, TB and HIV co-infection, uh, the struggles around managing repeated episodes of TB illness, uh, people's experiences of progressing from what they call normal TB to more drug resistant uh, strains of TB, uh, the struggles around diagnosis and the many challenges uh, around treatment and treatment adherence. So I would like to quickly play a snippet from one of the films called Umoya Omdaga to give an example uh, of this. <laughs> So, Uza Gukala eat treatment for six months. Yanginana eat normal TV. Does in Bangali, Nabila appetite. Nabila, 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 no empty because so Fruit for six months. And the art, what I tell two years, I'm going to scare the police as 60. For two years, it wasn't the genesis of the AMPs. Well, we can't just demand this as 
Okay. So within this shifted focus onto more personal um, reflections of TB illness as is seen in this film and the many other films that the learners have produced, um, this learner-driven media has shared the, day to, the intimate day-to-day -day struggles of navigating, managing, and surviving TB illness and almost invariably uh, revealed the social factors that shape life within the township and that make people vulnerable to infection. So while the title of the film can be understood to mean dirty air, this is umoya omdaka, as a, mo as a mode and means of transmission of TB, the word umoya in isiklosa also means life or life force. As indicated in the collection of films that learners have produced within the program, TB impacts and is impacted by other factors within people's lives. In addition to sharing the everyday struggles of managing TB illness, the narratives captured by learners also uncovered the struggles around the conditions in which TB sufferers, their families, and the broader community live in. These include poor sanitation um, and infrastructure, inadequate housing, unstable social welfare, uh, poverty, substance abuse, and gender-based violence, all of which uh, shaped the experience and illness trajectories of local residents. As such, these narratives and the films produced um, reflect the struggles around access, around inclusion and social justice that are consistently present in the experiences of, um, of ill health in the township. All of these issues reveal the political, economic and social forces that constrain TB sufferers' experiences of the disease and which also define the everyday realities within the township and shape people's ability to form responses to them. So through the young people's voices and perspectives regarding what is happening in their worlds, the films firmly demonstrate how TB, for which breathing is essential to its transmission, is also inseparable from the life and the social conditions in which it occurs and the lives and life force which it impacts. Oops. Okay. So this became more apparent uh, and more evident with the way in which there was a program responded to the coronavirus pandemic within the township and the kinds of work that it produced therein. Uh, with the emergence of COVID-19 in the country, it was I had to suspend its core program and had the opportunity to shift to producing a new set of films about the on the ground experiences of coronavirus in um, different neighborhoods in the township, replacing the work that the project was doing about TV. This shift was driven by it was a alumni. So previous so uh, learners who had previously graduated from there was a project um, whom had been previously trained in the program prior to COVID-19 and who recognized the immediate impact and effects that COVID-19 was having in their communities. So because of Iwaza's investment in capacity building um, within the project in previous years, the program was able to make uh, this shift towards a COVID-19 focus and respond to its needs very quickly through creating new collaborations and partnerships with organizations such as, um, or media artists such as Begi Sisa and other community-based activists on the ground. This work then built on the understanding of the social, political, and economic forces um, driving the pandemic that had been gained from engaging with issues around um, TB in the township. As such, exploring experiences of COVID-19 um, has been uncovering the ways in which local residents have been finding new strategies and approaches to understand and respond to the disease. Um, and the new challenges that it presents to their lives. So a statement like, at least with AIDS, you know how you get it, speaks not only to the novelty of COVID-19 for local residents, but to the changes that it has inflicted upon their daily, um, daily life in the township and the fears and anxieties that it has inserted into people's lives. Um, I'd like to play one more short snippet um, of a film called COVID Fears, which represents the work that uh, it was is now doing um, with COVID-19 in Kailija.
ンバーズ、ストマタイズ、ね、ジェントルウェイズ、ストマタイズ、ビコーズ、シングエナチュー、エンディッツ、ストロナウトヘン、エナウ、ビコーズ、ベアモナマス、ウシ、カラロンカシャンディアンズ、バカンツ、ベネノンドゥエニ、オガニンデンディブルシノシャンコキエナゴエンゴエニ、ソヨンガヤズ、バレエピオナント、ボコフネゲミンズ、ヨナヨイキス、サマコンビエンゴ、リンキガヤン。Kona le sopa pe moli biva li lukwa kumde be nayo. Kutingi doba umuke wa haya pa haya wiyazi loba lungu kwa be nayo umuka mbubo be kiteni sayo. So iya otu usaka usivile zuza lungu wa sayazi vikona yo na chage kuwa singa babandu sini doba haya ena nukumana mu. Kepe haja mwusi diki na kusinsu wa kina kumatala. Asuri kwa mdu ngeena alapa kuke yaki. Bila ngeena mangeena ngono sotia mgeena alalo kuke. ウェンディーロアイタンアクバラロアウゼンズスンジョンジョンスカイウトバホコバカネンデンキャンペザンキャネンデンゴクフネゲンディアバンディエンジンエムザゲリケイチスバンバスバニンスバスバニンザビアキ
TB have never included such aggressive control measures uh, such as that of the lockdown. However, the COVID films uh, in the program revealed that the stringent measures of the lockdown to control the spread of the, of the disease had a significantly had a significant social impact in settings such as Kailicha and revealed its incompatibility with life in the township and had a significant knock-on effect in people's lives. For example, because people could not work for a few months, there was no income being generated in many households and that affected their ability to pay rent. This then led to landlords evicting people from their homes and the evictions led to different kinds of uh, land um, occupations and settlements emerging around the township. These land occupations meant that people had to build homes in areas with poor infrastructure and with high sanitation, uh, high sanitation risks. And more importantly, this resulted in residents being put into constant conflict with municipality whom enforced further evictions on the land that residents had occupied at, the, um, at that point and created this vicious cycle to conclude here, um, I'd like to share a few key insights that have emerged from the work um, that it was that there was a program has been able to do with young people in Kailija. The first being that COVID-19 and TB cannot be understood outside of the social conditions in which these diseases occur. And both reveal how they define and shape people's experiences of infectious diseases. Secondly, the focus on biomedical approaches in both TB and COVID neglects the ways in which people in burdened settings um, feel and understand the issues around them. This has been more and more apparent in films produced by learners where the conversation, the conversation about TB or COVID-19 has been a broader conversation about the complexities that individuals navigate in their lives. And this requires more understanding, particularly now in the case of COVID-19, in order to avoid the mistakes that have been made with addressing and controlling TB. And lastly, behavioral change, um, sorry, behavioral change cannot come from the dissemination of biomedical facts alone. What should be prior prioritized is understanding where people are coming from um, and what they are going through and then tailoring responses according to that in order to be able to get people to adhere to the varied kinds of medical controls. Uh, one last point and then I'm done, I promise. <laughs> yep. Am I out of time? Yeah, you're out of time, Bianca, please. Uh, okay, just, just to make my last comment. Lastly, public engagement efforts um, require consistent investment and capacity building. So it was his ability to make the shifts that it made for COVID-19 highlights that public engagement efforts um, should be consistently invested in so that initiatives are able to adapt to the many challenges and changes that happen in, in the lives of affected communities and engage with those communities in more meaningful ways that recognize um, their struggles. And yeah, so to conclude, I'd like to send a shout, a shout out to the team and plug them a little here. If anyone is interested in viewing more of the videos, please follow us on social media, on YouTube, on Facebook, and let us know what you think about the films. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Bianca, for that interesting, uh, interesting uh, presentation. I've also learned how to pronounce Kailetia. Uh, uh, you know, I do not know how to pronounce it. But it's very interesting to see how this uh, uh, links to the idea of uh, I've learned about Moyo Mudaka, which is very, very interesting in uh, conceptualizing inversions of disease and the like. Um, uh, probably uh, in the interest of time, um, I would like us to go into the question and answer session. And I've seen um, quite a number of things flowing through the work by Chan, Garrett, and um, Bianca about AIR. I was trying to see how it relates to AIR and the other issues to do with the uh, infections and, and the like. Yeah, so maybe we, we may want to uh, get some responses. I might want to interject with my own from time to time. Um, uh, probably uh, we revert the order a bit because Chan was to be the first to present and uh, Garrett came ahead of her. If we have any questions addressed to 
either any of the presenters, please uh, let us know. Um, uh, that was a great presentation by all, uh, Bianca, uh, Garrett in the chat. Very nice presentation and very important in the dis disciplinary insights that we have got from this. So I welcome uh, any observations. We have only 15 minutes, uh, about less than 15 minutes for question and answer. Please, anybody who would want like to post some questions. Uh, probably we might want to begin with the, um, what I've seen already posted by Kim. Uh, Kim, if you are, if you would like to post your question uh, to Garrett. Kim, please. Yeah, the question was, um, could we have the question by Kim? Or if I would like to maybe um, rephrase it, Andrew, sorry. Uh, here in Kenya, we like uh, using the second name, yes, Andrew. Andrew, please, uh, is, is it possible for you to post your question to uh, Bannon? I think, uh, I think um, Garrett, uh, Andrew was very interested in knowing uh, how you would uh, uh, link uh, environmental justice uh, in communities, um, how you define it, environmental justice is defined in the communities. And uh, yeah. you're giving some examples of uh, the, environment, uh, the definition of environmental justice from the people's view. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, and so on, on two points, uh, one, one I might say is when Andrew, uh, Dr. Kim uh, asked the question, what I thought about uh, the first person who came to mind was a scholar called Eve Tuck. And Eve Tuck writes about uh, this concept of desire focused research that in um, communities we should be thinking about, you know, what, what does justice look like and what, what are all these new imaginaries that transcend the stereotypical um, descriptions uh, of like extractive industries and stuff like that? So what, what does the future like? So I saw that in his question, um, you know, what, what would justice look like? Uh, so my question in the research didn't specifically focus on this. Um, but there are hints towards it. So if you look at what uh, community struggles are ongoing at the moment, I think primarily uh, there's a statement in the research where it says, you know, land is central to uh, think about alternative economies, thinking about um, a just transition and so forth, because um, it's through land that you can do a lot. So I think um, in terms of psychology in South Africa, there's a lot of historical structural issues that have been unaddressed and we haven't gone deep enough to really think about uh, what, what things like land mean, for instance. So it's more than just uh, property, but it's, it's to do with identity. It's to do with also imagining a different future. So that's, I think, one thing. Other very uh, practical things are things like uh, procedural and participatory justice. Are communities being, um, are people being uh, involved properly in decisions that affect them? And we've seen issues uh, across the country in terms of the approval of prospecting or mineral rights. We've seen it in Olobeni, um, we've seen it in Sumkele, and uh, now with the CES in Special Economic Zone in Limpopo. And, but I think that there's very positive kind of development. So for instance, in Olobeni where um, uh, the community won the right to say uh, no to mining so there's, there is this contested terrain. The last thing that I want to draw attention to is the enforcement of 
of policies. So we can write very good policies, but are these actually being implemented on the ground? And um, it's often the implementation of environmental impact assessments or management plans that have an impact on health. And then also um, corrective justice. Do we respond quick enough when there are actually issues? Um, uh, I think there's a statement um, in a report on air pollution, uh, and I can just pick it out and I'll put it in the chat. But basically ESCOM was saying, you know, uh, should we not, and ESCOM's the utility, electricity utility service in South Africa, saying, um, you know, the costs of focusing on health are too high, um, it would be too high on ESCOM, and can't we overlook some of these issues? So there's a real political terrain um, that has an impact on, on, on mental health, essentially. So I think that you know, justice is key to addressing mental health in South Africa. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Garage, for that. I think I can see a lot of uh, issues with regard to politi political economy of uh, all of these happenings. And I think uh, probably uh, you are looking at uh, issues about embodiment, uh, embodiment of the, you know, you know, what happens to people and the like. Which I've also seen uh, coming out very nicely in your in your presentation, the connection. Uh, think about uh, this resistant point of care and the uh, and the like. Uh, and I could see that there's a lot of uh, issues that could come around, maybe with the environmental distress that comes with maybe <laughs> pollution of air, which can also be embodied in different ways. Yeah. So mm -hmm. thanks for that response. And um, I think uh, for the purpose uh, of time, maybe I would love to invite other people. Question for my other panelists, if that is allowed. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, if there aren't any other questions, um, I was just well. I was thinking about maybe how to connect to these very diverse um, uh, papers, and one of the ways in which I thought they maybe linked were in finding ways to absorb or live with. Um, contamination, you know, or, or kind of ir irreversible environmental change. So this kind of forms of grieving um, and adaptation seems to be, you know, for things like TB, there, there is no cure, COVID, there's no cure. So how do you um, process the, and, and similarly for obviously environmental change. Um, so that's, I mean, maybe a comment that if anyone wants to pick up on, but the question I have is the difficulty and struggle, which I imagine you both have, which and uh, how to um, work around the word community. You know, I always think, you know, you don't use the word community for, for the community of Parkview, but we use the word community for the community of Kailicho or um, Rustenburg um, and the ways in which, uh, yeah, that's troubling or not. I think this is something that most people wrestle with a lot um, anyway, but and it, it looks like someone else has a question. So you can take those as comments if you like. Sorry, I was off muted, sorry. Um, thanks, Chan, for that, that intervention. And um, yeah, I think uh, it is important also to see how the idea of AI also goes uh, in the three presentations. I was looking at a direction where I can see you come out. This is about environment. And uh, how do people conceptualize this with regard to uh, with regard to pollution, and then related to the political part, economy of, uh, of issues about uh, maybe common good that comes to air uh, and the like, and uh, I could see it linking also very well with the the presentation by Bianca about this uh, issue of moy uh, of data of data about bad air. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I can pick from uh, what others will say in terms of uh, maybe what we call in anthropology biocultural adaptation, how do people really uh, use their, uh, their physical capabilities and cultural capabilities to have sustainable adaptation to these changes, changes in, the, uh, in the environment as such. So as others speak 
on uh, on that to continue the brief discussion because we are running out of time. Uh, I would welcome any other observations uh, regarding the presentation. Any specific uh, observations about uh, Bianca's uh, um, presentation? Um, I see that um, there's also a question from Carla and Nawazi, which I'd like to hear. Yeah. Oh, okay, yes. This, uh, in, in terms of the community, so uh, Brown, Brown and colleagues have, have an interesting kind of uh, definition of community. So in my research, uh, I must be explicit that most of the people I accessed was through an organization called Boer Mining Communities. So uh, uh, it's a, a community organization that basically uh, is networked across the Rustenburg uh, district and uh, who who basically are in you know calling for procedure and all these these other issues but Brown and colleagues have a really interesting definition when we think of breath and the embodiment is um, he's got a term called embodied health movements so uh, a, this community would would potentially be an embodied health movement where people have been directly affected, and I imagine in the case of TB it's the same, directly affected by a certain condition or environment where there's a sense of identity that comes from um, that shared experience. Um, but in community psychology, a community is sent and it could be rust and it could be anything. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, Carla, sorry, I did not see your racing hand. Uh, please, Carla. That's fine. Thank you, Miss. Um, thank you very much for the presentations. I think the thing that, that's interesting for me, and, and it kind of touches on a couple of the comments that have been made, is that there are a number of interesting things coming out here that are both about the specificities of discipline, but also about the importance of thinking beyond and across disciplines. So the discussions about community and what constitutes community looks and sounds different, and the discussions around privilege and who holds or, or controls that space in research and in production, um, you know, has received a lot of attention in some disciplines and perhaps is, is, is being discussed in others. I appreciated that, um, you know, Bianca, one of the things that was central to your to your work was the notion of the importance of building and establishing sustainable mechanisms within research communities as opposed to the research communities being spaces in which people parachute into and come out of. So that's a kind of interesting space. The thing that strikes me about all three of the presentations is the importance of historicity. So, you know, as John, I mean, you referred to some of the works about how people have started to reconfigure, reconfigure of spaces and places and people within them. And Bianca, you referenced, you know, the, the, the kind of centrality of tuberculosis, and it is. Tuberculosis has, for as long as we've had histories of diseases and epidemics, there are particular social fractures that you can track where tuberculosis has appeared and how it has or has not been addressed. And Garrett, I mean, similarly, you know, the, the, the conversations you're having now are those that also have been strongly held, you know, since 1912 and if not before, when the centralities of, of land and the, cent and the importance of land and the responses to the experiences of mining, you know, there's, there, you know, there's articles that speak of women talking about all we do is we make you know, we make children to go and die in the mines. So there are these long held histories in all three of these presentations that speak through a kind of a, a kind of generational way of experiencing these different health concerns. And I think what was interesting for me is that what these spaces allow are these conversations across our disciplines and spaces in that way. So there's it's not really a question so much as a as a comment and a and a kind of a, I think a consideration for all of us in terms of our research methodologies and our works of that recognition of what it is we learn from and across time and space and place. And yeah, to thank you all for for thinking through those spaces. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, color for that uh, observation and the comment. Uh, yeah, I'm also relying on um, management of time from our colleagues there, uh, Charlotte. I don't know whether we have any more time for this. Um, I was just wondering um, how Bianca um, you want to relate this response of Moyo of Daka to the differentials in the responses to. HIV AIDS, exactly um, uh, COVID 19, which seem to be airborne. 
uh, how, how would you link the concept of, uh, of modern metabolism in bad air to the advent of HIV AIDS in the, uh, according to the for people? Mm-hmm. Sorry. Uh, I didn't catch the last part of your, your question. Yeah, the last part of the question is about uh, linking the idea of uh, this bad air, more than that, mm. uh, to differentials in response to COVID-19, TB, and now we have HIV AIDS, uh, which could not be directly related to bad air. How am I linking them? How I can link them? I mean, I think you can you can see the similarities between. I haven't really thought about it in terms of HIV, um, but you can definitely see the the links between um, the concept of bad air between TB and um, COVID nineteen because of the idea of contamination that comes with both of them. And um, yeah, now I'm thinking about it in terms of HIV. I've I've never really put it in 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 my mind to think about um, HIV. But bad air isn't just really about physical air. It's also about the the collective complications of social life in these townships, um, the the social struggles and issues that are shaping what um, Kailicha looks like and what how people are able to navigate these issues around um, ill health within Kailicha. I think that's the thread. I don't, I think with, with TB and COVID, it's more apparent because both are infectious diseases transmitted through air, but with, with HIV, it's more about these, these, these struggles in everyday life that people experience and how, I don't know if I'm answering your question because now I'm trying to think about the second part. I, I kept not hearing. Yeah. yeah, I think it's those, yeah, it's the connections between those small intimate struggles that people face on a political level in terms of power, in terms of struggles around power, struggles around access, struggles around social justice. Um, yeah, that's how I've been imagining it and thinking about it in the writing of this paper and in developing this presentation. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, Bianca. Um, I hope we are not uh, locking anybody out of this discussion. Um, regarding the various issues that you want to present to us maybe in the next one minute. If there is anything, anything outstanding you would like the presenters to highlight, uh, you are welcome to make that quick intervention. And maybe as you think, maybe I was thinking that uh, 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 Chang could have uh, uh, elaborated or whether, whether um, the poetry that will be related to uh, underwater uh, experience would be different if that was the, the experience of uh, poetry, local poetry in the sense that um, this is poetry could, uh, constructed in English. I was wondering whether we would find different uh, uh, poetic representation of the experience underwater, drowning, and the breathing underwater, let's say by the local uh, Kosa person or the local Zulu person. Yeah, I'd love to um, be able to work across all of the languages um, and including actually Swahili um, is a very common language on the east coast of Africa where I do a lot of work as well. Um, I have worked on um, poets that are bilingual, um, but yeah, I'm recruiting for postdocs if anyone wants to work on Kosa language poetry. Yeah, so, so you see, my, 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 uh, my curiosity is about uh, uh, multivocality in the research. Multivocality in the sense that um, the experience of Indian Ocean, uh, the experience of this water, is the East African coast to, towards South Africa, uh, may be presented differently by different people looking at uh, think about what is underwater and how does it represent life and how, the, how do our bodies behave underwater. Yeah, actually, as you say, maybe we'd be very curious to see um, uh, how people who learn swimming uh, without uh, uh, professional uh, styles would represent the experience underwater and breathing underwater. So maybe probably that is a, that could be another dimension, as you say, uh, you may want to recruit more people to see whether whether we have a common a common human experience 
Good Absolutely. Morning. I mean, there, there is a lot of material on this already. I'm already working on the the east coast of this country in Durban, Mahale Mashigo is writing about this. Um, there's a, um, work on um, pearl divers, narratives of pearl divers on the east African coast. So the, the diversity of experience is something that I, we, we, it's going to be a much longer conversation, which I'd love to have with you. Okay. Um, yeah. Can I just and, Sorry. and that I had a question for you, Sean, and also for Bianca, who seems to have left. Oh, she's still there. Um, and, and, I, and I don't expect you to answer it right now um, because we're running out of time and we have run out of time. But Sean, it was about depth as a trait and you just kind of mentioned it in passing. And I wanted you to say a little bit more about that, but we can talk about this off screen. But right now, Ben, I just intervene and say that Carla has got something to say about the next session. And can she please be given to say that? Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> It's always that horrible thing that you have to do at a session when people are like about to start all the really interesting discussions that you then must say, sorry, we're out of time. I do hope that many of you who have comments and inputs to make will continue these conversations outside of this virtual space. Uh, this was just to remind people that the, the kind of central theme this week is linking to breath in the environment and that we've already had the launch of work by Althea Dorators, Malak and Lovu, made a particular piece, performance piece for the symposium. Um, and we also have work by Tessa Ware, Makosazana um, Kaba, and Neil Overy. So we have a variety of creative works that are up and on the website for this week. And we'd love for you to go and have a look at them in your own time when you're able to do so. Um, and we'd also like to remind you that there is another session after this one, uh, which has uh, discussions around unpacking narratives of dust underground in South African mines, oxygen and suffocation in South African health systems, and the politics of respiration. So that session starts at three, so there's enough time to get yourself a quick beverage, have a comfort break, and join us and register for that session. Um, and also that we still have another workshop um, on Oxygen Advantage, which is, which is an oxygen breathing system, a, a breath kind of awareness system, and more um, works that will be coming up that I think will link in some interesting ways to some of the presentations today, including ones uh, around young people, mental health and COVID. So please do take some time to have a look at that on the breath.medicalandhealthhumanities.africa website. And also to remind people that after this, you have a whole other week of exciting breath stuff to be part of. So we really hope to see you at the future uh, events for our final week, which is called Pause. Um, and at our keynote lecture, which is being given, our second keynote, which is being given by Professor Jay McNaughton um, from the Institute of Medical Humanity at Durham. Thank you so very much to the amazing organizers, presenters, the back end team who do all that hard unseen work that is often unseen and unacknowledged, um, and to everyone for your questions and participation. And Benson for chairing for us. It is so very lovely to see you. We have, we have seen words of each other so long and not each other's faces. So it is lovely to see your faces. Um, thank, you. thank you very much, everyone. All right. Yeah, thank you everybody for the thank wonderful session. And uh, let's keep it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.